You joined the Aryan Brotherhood, and within a year, you actually became a leader in that group. I did, yes. And you became a, a commissioner, a California commissioner I did. of the AB. Mm -hmm. Yes. So at that point, you were a shot caller. Yes. So what were the type of things that you were doing in that leadership role at that point? Well, my focus, one of the reasons I rose to a position of leadership was one, because of my physical prowess, the various knife fights I'd been in. So that was a, a proven commodity, if you will, that was an asset to the Aryan Brotherhood. Um, but um, I also took steps even before rising to that level uh, to stop the drug use by the members. You want to remember that the Aryan Brotherhood at that time had control of all the resources in Old Folsom and all the resources in San Quentin. And as I said, that represented a lot of money. But all that money was going into the arms of the membership. They were all drug addicts. And uh, just bad business. Um, I'm not a drug addict, never have been. And so I looked at it from a different perspective, that the revenues that were being generated, tens of thousands of dollars, um, were being used so that the membership could party and live large and just kick back. Um, so my focus was to turn that create an infrastructure that was business orientated and invest those resources in a legitimate enterprise. I mean, it's not novel. Many, many organizations have done it. And um, this, uh, in my opinion, this organization at that time was um, ripe for making that turn towards organized crime. And that was really my interest was organized crime. Um, well, at one point, Charles Manson ended up in prison in Folsom. He did, yeah. And the Aryan Brotherhood had some sort of level of connection with Manson at one point and the Manson family. Well, yes, they did. I used uh, Manson's uh, girls as a resource to smuggle knives and other weapons into old Folsom. But uh, the thing to remember about uh, Charlie was that uh, Charlie was a punk and uh, literally a punk, as well as a pedophile. So, you know, where he, he had the um, so-called charisma to move these youngsters out there on the street, mostly women, but um, to their credit, intelligent women, but um, obviously not emotionally intelligent, that were looking apparently for some kind of guidance. He, uh, he played them and he used them. But he himself as an individual um, was not well thought of by the Aryan Brotherhood and was simply used for the resources that he had, which were substantial. Well, at that point, did Manson have the swastika uh, on his forehead or no? He did, yeah. You know, he, he did that, um, um, I think while he was still in the county jail. But it wasn't, if not, then it wasn't too long after he hit uh, um, prison, the joint, um, that he did that. And um, his girls followed. But um, I was in communication with most of them at um, um, Chino, where they were housed. And then I was in communication with a number of them on the street. Uh, there were a number of them that were associated back then with an organization called Tribal Thumb. And uh, they were interested in putting together a commune. You want to remember that uh, back in the 70s, uh, the idea of a egalitarian society was very big on the agenda of most um, revolutionary forces. And so this was a group of girls that were attended Berkeley, uh, University of California at Berkeley. And um, I did recruit them to smuggle weapons in, and uh, they did smuggle those weapons in. And uh, I continued that relationship with them, uh, and as well as individuals uh, on the street. To Charlie's credit, I suppose, uh, there were individuals like Sandra Good and, and uh, Squeaky Fromm, whom I also talked to, um, that remained loyal to Charlie, um, but just that. Well, you know, when you see these interviews with Charles Manson, he looks like a crazy person. But in terms of off camera, in terms of, you know, your relationship, <laughs> yeah. was Manson crazy or was it all an act? It was all an act, Vlad. You know, I spent 10 years in lockup with Charlie and um, I know him on a very, very intimate level. Um, I know his fears. I mean, he's passed over now, but you know, then 
I knew his fears, his anxieties, and what he would do was that he had, um, he had a portfolio of choreographed um, acts that he would just kind of, you know, pull off the shelf, and it depended on who, whom he was talking to, whether it was a woman or a man. And, um, but if you listen to him closely um, in all those interviews, he's not really saying anything at all. Um, <laughs> And um, he's just bumping his gums. You know, Charlie is one of the original jaw jackers. It's a term I use to describe most methamphetamine users, but I now find that uh, in my experience with the internet, that the internet's full of jaw jackers. And um, they just can't seem to help themselves. And Charlie was one of them individuals. You know, the media made Charlie um, is really what it comes down to. You know, the, there's no question that the crimes in which he was associated with were heinous. And, um, and I can understand why the media did make them that way. Um, they were atrocious crimes. Right. I mean, from what I understand, a lot of members in the Aryan Brotherhood didn't like him because he murdered a pregnant Sharon Tate. That's correct. So you weigh that against the resources that he has available to him. Um, you don't allow him to become too close, but you do give him protection. And uh, because there were a lot of people that wanted to kill him. But, you know, um, I mean, it's no different. I spent time, the same 10 years that I spent with Charlie, I spent with Sirhan Sirhan and Juan Corona and other individuals of that ilk, if you will. And it really all renders down to the same thing. Um, it's a matter of providing protection for them and utilizing whatever resources they have available to them to the benefit of the organization.